I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers. So you have to agree that this conference has been extremely well organized. For example, I was invited four years ago in advance, <laughs> which gave me plenty of time to prepare the talk. They also prepared the weather very well, and considering that they did this four years in advance is incredible, which actually prevented me from finishing the preparation of the talk. <laughs> so I'm actually going to talk about something else. I was going to talk about ordinals, but I'm going to give another talk about ordinals, which was prepared. But fortunately, in the abstract, I only told you that I was going to talk about ordinals, so it's fine. <laughs> so. Okay, so, so this is the problem I want to consider here. Actually, let's hide as much as possible. So suppose that every inhabited subset of the natural numbers has a minimal element, yeah, which is true classically. Then the principle of excluded middle holds. Yeah? You can form this set that I'm defining there. I'm not going to... Um, go into this now. But the point is that then the natural numbers are not, at least constructively, are not an ordinal in the usual sense of classical mathematics. Uh, Ingo said a little bit about that in his, uh, what was it? The induction revolution, if you remember that. So a second thing you can do is, um, if you're given a, a subset of the natural numbers, even a decidable subset or complemented subset, you can't tell whether it is empty or else find the point of it, yeah? However, I'm going to actually exhibit plenty of ordinals which I'm going to call compact, and you will see why later, which actually do have this property for any given decidable subset, you can tell whether it is empty or else exhibit a point, provided this set is decidable, yeah? I'm going to give you the definition of ordinal later, but the one I am adopting is the same as uh, the one in the hot book, which is the same as the one that Topos theorists before the hot book adopted, like uh, for instance in the paper by Andreas Blass that uh, Ingo mentioned. But before doing, considering ordinals, I'm going to consider a simplified version of the problem I want to talk about, okay? And uh, I'm going to switch here from decidable subsets from into equivalently into maps into the Booleans. It just for, will make some language easier for me, but it doesn't make any difference. So given a set and a Boolean valued predicate, uh, the task is to either exhibit an element of x, which is, I call it a root, or determine that p has no root, yeah? And the question is, which sets x, for which set x, this can be done? Uh, there is an immediate counterexample, which is the set of natural numbers, right? You cannot do this for the set of natural numbers. But, uh, okay, so what does it mean to do that? Well, in terms of uh, computation, this is an exhaustive search problem. So you want to exhaustively search the type and then check whether there is something satisfying the property and if there is, exhibit it, and otherwise tell none of these elements satisfy the property. Now, in terms of logic, actually, this is a, this is a kind of a choice axiom. In fact, we are going to see it is a very strong choice axiom if we assume that all types satisfy this property. And in terms of topology, it turns out to be a compactness pro problem, okay? And in order to explain that, I will have to do, like many other talks here, of course it's obligatory it seems, I'm going to show you a topos for this. So let me now discuss briefly the type theory I'm going to consider. This is going to be very similar to the one that uh, Peter Lumsden uh, had in his talk yesterday. So we're going to consider Martin Left type theory, but a very Spartan one. 
So I'm going to have empty type, uh, unit type, natural numbers, binary disjoint sums, products, arbitrary disjoint sums, arbitrary products, and identity type, and universes. Sometimes you're going to have inductive types, and uh, if I get far enough in this set of slides, you will also see at the end an in a recursive inductive type, but I doubt that we'll have time, time for that. Also, I'm going to consider that uh, we are going to assume the univalence axiom, not all the time, but uh, in some crucial parts. And then, so from this, it follows that we also have function extensionality and propositional extensionality. Yeah, so two functions are equal or identified if and only if they're point-wise identified, and two propositions are equal if and only if they're logically equivalent. Now, although we work in multi-left type theory, we don't work with propositions as types. We work with propositions as sub-singleton types, or equivalently, types that have at most one element, okay? So this is, when I say proposition here, this is what I mean. And I'm going to need to sometimes set quotient, that's a higher inductive type, technically speaking, but also this is equivalent to having two things. One is propositional truncation. So what is the propositional truncation? So you have a type, you have a unique map into the unit type, and uh, what happened? Oh, why is it switching off? Oh, because I'm not moving anything here. Okay, I don't know, I don't remember how to allow, uh, disable timeout, so we'll hit, okay. So, um, propositional truncation, you take the of x, you consider the unique map into the unit type, and you look at the image of this map, yeah, so intuitively, intuitively, or let's say classically, if the type is inhabited, then the image is going to be one. And if the type is not in inhabited, the image is zero, this is the empty type. But that's a, um, that's a very bad intuition when you work constructively, which we are doing here, yeah? So there are many models. Um, and because we reason constructively, uh, the, the, the results are true in all models, so the models on types of sets. Of course, you can extend this to a univalent model using techniques that people in this audience have uh, developed. Uh, then there is the primary one for univalence, which is what uh, Vevovsky wanted, is that types are interpreted as homotopy type in the sense of homotopy theory. Then there is a computational interpretation, so realizability models, but more generally, toposes, even infinity toposes. So this is my type theory. And there is one topos that um, will be important for me. I'm not sure for you, but it's important for me because it plays a guiding role for me. So whenever I make a definition in type theory, Sometimes I test it in the topological topos to see what it means, but sometimes I already know something is true in the topological topos, and I say, can I write uh, an expression in type theory to, yeah? So we want to use, I want to use uh, type theory to give me, uh, sorry, the topological topos to give me intuition about my, let's say, formal development. By the way, this has been formalized in ACTA, not, not the models, but uh, the theorems in type theory that I'm going to show you. So what is this topological topos? Um, it's a topos that embeds not all topological spaces, but uh, it embeds fully the sequential topological spaces. So that's a very large category of topological spaces, has the reals, and it is Cartesian closed. So you have function spaces that behave well. And so you can interpret in particular, uh, as you see in, this, in the second bubble of the onion, um, you can interpret system T in the topological topos, but uh, already the sequential uh, topological spaces suffice. Now, if you want to interpret pi and sigma, you have to go a little bit beyond 
um, sequential topological spaces because sequential topological spaces are not locally Cartesian closed. And if you want to interpret things like the type of propositions, omega and logic, then you need the full topos. Yeah? So what you do is you start from the inner bubble, so you consider a very small category of topological spaces, and this category has the so-called one-point compactification of the natural numbers. So you add a point at infinity to the natural numbers so that it becomes a compact Hausdorff space. Consider all the continuous maps um, in, from it into itself, and then you consider what uh, topos theory is called a canonical topology. It doesn't matter much, but uh, what matters is that you obtain a category that has uh, all these properties written there, okay? So, for example, even if you wanted to only consider sequential spaces, it's good to have the other stuff because they allow you to do logic, okay? So let's do some examples, actually, to see if uh, this rings a bell with you. So let's try to define spaces using type theory. Okay, we can define the natural numbers. You get the natural numbers with a discrete topology. It's actually given in the type theory. You can define the two-point discrete space, that's uh, one plus one. Now, if you take the function space or the function type of functions from natural numbers to the booleans, actually, in this model, it gets the Cantor topology, which is the same as a product of countably, topological product of countably many copies of the two-point space, the very space. And also, you know, this object we started with, the one-point compactification to build the whole topos can be defined in type theory. So you can, you can take the type of all alpha, so the sequences of Booleans, which are decreasing. So, for example, the number three is represented by one, 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 and then zero forever, yeah? So the number of ones, you count how many ones you have, and that's the number you're representing, and there may be infinitely many ones, and that's infinity, yeah? And uh, if you calculate a little bit, and you see what topology you get, then you get the correct topology of the one-point compactification. Now, I'm going to consider a variation of the previous space, which is actually going to be good for counterexamples. So I'm going to con consider a compactification of the natural, discrete natural numbers with two points at infinity. So the sequence 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 will converge to one infinity, but it also converges to the other infinity. And so it is not Hausdorff, because in a Hausdorff space, a sequence converges to at most one point, and uh, this will be useful for some examples. Okay, so let me write in type theory what I said in words before. So we said in words we can pick a root of p if it has any. So I'm going to consider the given um, as property of x, okay? So fix a, a type x, and I want to consider this property given any p from x to the booleans, you can either find an x which is a root of p, or you can prove that uh, every point is not a root. Okay? And this is uh, um, stronger than excluded middle. Uh, you will see, actually, it will be equivalent to global choice uh, in the next uh, slide. And for people who know about homotopy type theory, so notice that I'm really, I'm using sigma. I'm not using exists, okay? And uh, the question we want to study today is which types X satisfy this choice principle, okay? And I'm going to call these types compact. And uh, it is because they are going to be compact topologically in the model. But we have to be a little bit careful uh, when we say that. But before that, uh, so let's look at, um, uh, at the statement, suppose all types are compact, uh, you get not only excluded middle, but you get global choice, which says, given any type, if it's non-empty, you can find the point of it. Okay, so this is much stronger than, than, um, than, um, Excluded middle, of course, and then choice. 
um, and this uh, choice is choice is compatible with univalence and the excluded middle. In fact, the first model of, um, of a univalent type theory by Vladimir Vivovsky was a model in simplicial sets or homotopy types. Um, and this model, if you assume classical logic in the meta theory, this model validates univalence, choice, and, um, and excluded middle, of course, it follows from choice. But there is no model of univalence that is compatible with global choice. Yeah? Because basi basically univalence says roughly that all your mathematical statements are invariant under uh, isomorphisms, but uh, if you can there is, it is impossible to choose a point in a way that is invariant under isomorphisms or under automorphisms. Nevertheless, there are plenty of compact types. So what you cannot have is that all types are compact because this gives global choice, but uh, you can have some anupam. Uh, you mentioned uh, all types are compact, why that implies global choice holds, but um, is it obvious you have global choice? Uh, it depends on what you consider obvious. Uh, so the, the Agda proves uh, two lines in each direction. It is obvious, but let me not, let's discuss this later, okay? <coughs> but it's not hard. Okay, and also, and also the, the ones I can construct, they turn out to be all equipped with well orders. I cannot actually construct any example which is not well ordered. Normally you have a difficulty giving well orders to things you want to give well orders. I have a difficulty here not giving well orders. <laughs> yeah, so they, they arise from the process of construction of this. And um, prove what? No, no, okay, we'll get to see soon that uh, we are not uh, going to be able to prove that some things are compact uh, when they are uh, compact in the model. Okay, um, in fact, uh, yeah, this is, this is a good question, but I will come to it. Okay, so by the discussion of the first slide, we saw that um, for the purposes of constructive mathematics, it's not a good idea to define an ordinal in the same way as you define in classical mathematics, namely a linearly ordered set such that every non-empty subset has a least element, yeah? So this doesn't work even for the natural numbers. So what people do is they join the inductive revolution that uh, Ingo explained to you, uh, was it yesterday? Or the day before? Tuesday. Tuesday. So, um, okay, so, you consider a type equip, equipped with a proposition valued relation. You require this, it's transitive. And also you say if you have two points which have the same predecessors, then the points themselves must be equal. Yeah? And now the third point can be said in two different equivalent ways. One is, um, you consider the definition that uh, Ingo gave you as an inductive definition, you define a point to be accessible if all the predecessors are accessible, yeah? Of course, the base case is when there are no predecessors, so minimal element is accessible, and then if there isn't one after that, it will be accessible using this definition and so on, which reminds me that somebody before my talk asked me if my talk was going to be accessible. There is some form of accessibility. So, um, but it's also equivalent to the principle of transfinite induction. So this equivalent to saying that um, you can prove properties, um, you can prove a property holds for every X by showing that whenever it holds for all the predecessors of X, uh, it also holds for X, yeah? And which is constructively true, for example, for the natural numbers. There is a one reason why one uses the definition using accessibility and not the, the one written there, 
which is the one used accessibility lives in the same universe as you are, whereas this one, because it quantifies overall propositions, it lives in the next universe. But however, in practice, I end up using this one because it's more convenient to think about. But uh, to define ordinal, it's better to use the other one, to define the type of ordinals. Uh, for homotopy type theorists, um, you may know, have noticed that I didn't require X to be a set, but this follows automatically. In the hot book, they require this as, a, as an extra requirement, but uh, it, you can actually prove it from, from extensionality. Um, so if you don't know what a set is, a type is called a set. So, you know, in multi left type theory, there is the identity type. And now, uh, in homotopy type theory, it says, well, there may be examples of two points which can be identified into different ways. And the type is a set when between any two points there is at most one identification. And for example, the natural numbers are sets, functions from natural numbers to booleans are sets, the real numbers are set, and so on. Um, but for example, uh, the type of groups is not a set, not because it's large, not because it's a class, but uh, because the identifications of groups are group isomorphisms, and univalence tells you that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between Martin left identifications and group isomorphisms, and so this is an example of a type which is not a set. Um, we will have that actually the type of all ordinals itself is going to be a set, a large set, right? So it's very difficult to talk about this when you are in an audience with at least one set theorist. Uh, we're gonna say it's not a set, I don't mean it's a class. I mean in the homotopy sense, yeah? Um, and this follows from univalence because from univalence you can prove that the martin love identifications between two ordinals are in bijection with the isomorphisms of ordinals, but uh, well other sets can be isomorphic in at most one way, as you know. And so there is at most one identification between two ordinals, which makes the type of ordinals into a set. Now, trichotomy doesn't always hold. For, so in fact, uh, trichotomy holds for all ordinals if and only if uh, the law of excluded middle holds. Yep. So it only holds in very few toposes called Boolean. But there are plenty of trichotomous ordinals. Uh, the natural numbers is one example, of course. Um, what else do I want to say here? Yeah, so I forgot. Okay, so by univalence, you can prove that uh, the type of ordinals is itself an ordinal. And, uh, and also, uh, going to be important, if I get there, um, for our constructions, that uh, you can form suprema, uh, list upper bounds, of families uh, of ordinals, provided they are indexed by a small index set. And it's very interesting that uh, the paper in which uh, Tom de Jong and I uh, published, which in particular contains two, was published today. <laughs> Just in time for what I say in this talk to be really true. <laughs> yes. um, okay, so now let's look at the Boolean valued functions. So of course, uh, Boolean valued functions classify complemented subtypes, yeah? But if you look at the topological topos, so I told you the, the, the Booleans two are interpreted as the two point discrete space, yeah? And this means that uh, when you take the inverse image of, uh, let's say over one in this function from X to two, that will give you a set which is both open and closed. So it's a clopen set. Yeah, so this is a clopen set classifier. Yeah. Now, my definition of compactness probes 
the type X by looking at maps into the booleans. If there aren't enough maps into the booleans, like for example the real numbers, there is no clopen set in the real numbers, yeah, other than the empty set and the whole real numbers, which means there are only two functions from the reals to the booleans, and they are the constant zero and the constant one functions, yeah? So if you ask uh, the topological topos, is the real line compact using this definition of this talk, I will say yes, it is compact. But of course the real numbers are not compact, yeah? So we need to do something about that, and we need to consider types which have plenty of clopen sets, if you like. So I call them totally separated. And actually there is an intuitive way to say that. So topologically people say a space is totally separated if the clopens separate the points. Yeah, for example, the Cantor space is, uh, is totally separated. So given any two points which are not the same, you can find a clopen which contains one but not the other. But there is a positive way of saying that. Uh, which makes sense uh, to logicians. So normally you say two points, uh, two elements are the same if they satisfy the same properties. That's Leibniz principle. Now consider another notion saying two points are the same if they satisfy the same Boolean valued properties. Yeah, so call this Boolean Leibniz principle. So I call a type totally separated if it satisfies the Boolean Leibniz principle. It is not true for all types, for example, for the real numbers. For the real numbers, uh, they, um, in, you cannot prove that they satisfy the Boolean uh, Leibniz principle, say Dedekind reals. Yeah, so I say it. one way to say that is, yeah, so that's the Boolean in the definition there. The second definition is the Boolean uh, valued principle. Yeah, so, um, and as I said before, verbally, that when you look at what this means in the topological topos, this means the, the topological notion with the same name, which is that uh, the clopen separate the points. Okay, so what's going to happen is the following. Uh, this definition of compact that we have in the first definition is going to coincide with what the topological topos believes is compact, so the topological notion of compactness, but only for totally separated types, not for arbitrary types. Yeah? So you can, actually, you can actually account for all types if you want, but uh, you have to change your test space. Yeah, your test space has to be uh, something like the Sierpinski space. So it's not a discrete space, because the Sierpinski space classifies clopen, sorry, opens as opposed to clopens. So this definition with this classifier only works for the spaces that have uh, sufficiently many clopens to the extent that they can completely describe the topology in some sense. Okay? Okay, so now um, we carry on um, with um, types, so forget topological spaces. So, yes. Bool is compact because if you give me a function from bool to bool, I check p of zero, I check p of one. If both are false, I answer the second component. Oh. Uh, yeah, and uh, um, if I find one, I answer the first component. So finite types are compact. Because what this is saying is that you can exhaustively search the space. Yeah, that's, that's all it's saying in, in computational terms. Yeah, so, and, and this is precisely the, the analogy which we're trying to do is that um, what we call in computer science and constructive mathematics exhaustively searchable is what topologists call compact. Okay, so that's the idea. But only for certain types, the totally separated ones. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so thanks for the question, actually. So, um, so the totally separated types are sets in the sense of a homotopy type theory. Uh, they form an exponential ideal, which means if you have a x, r, o, y, and y is totally separated, then this function type is, um, is uh, also totally separated, and, um, and they are also pi ideal. So they're close on the products, the totally separated types, they're close on the retracts, and in fact, in type theory, it's very difficult to construct a type which is not totally separated. You can, for example, the Dedekind reals, you can construct them. But uh, if you just use the normal constructions, uh, it's, it's difficult. And uh, for example, this implies that all system T types within Martin left type theory are totally separated. Uh, but there's one example which is written here in the topological topos. Uh, remember that I defined this space uh, with uh, two points at infinity, yeah? This space is not totally separated because there is no closed and open set which separates the point at infinity. And in fact, uh, you can prove this, we can sort of prove this inside type theory. You can prove that uh, if there is a map from this space there in the corner that to the booleans, which answers true for one point and false for um, another point, then you can prove the weak, limited principle of omniscience that from Bishop, which says you given any binary sequence, you can tell whether uh, it is constantly one or not. Yeah, or const something like that. Yes. Yes, yeah, so there are two ways. I think I said this in a moment. There, there's, there, I know at least three ways to do that. Um, I'm going to mention one or two. Um, yeah, so basically, yeah. We are going to get to Tikhonov, yeah. Just a moment. <laughs> you, the audience obviously is asking the right questions, yes, yeah, so thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes. But in the topos, we can disprove it. In the topos, it's false. It is not totally separated. Because, as I said, the two infinities cannot be separated by a clopen set. Um, in, in the model of simplicial sets, uh, you can actually separate these two points because um, what simplicial sets do is they take a topological space and then perform a little bit of destruction. It, it only, you know, only the space up to homotopy, but uh, because these things are, uh, you know, there are going to be very few paths in this space. <laughs> so paths are not enough to describe this space. Um, yeah, so I said already the simple types are totally separated. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to skip five. Yeah, and so to your question, here is one way at the bottom uh, right. So there, there is another way to say that X is totally separated. So you have this natural map from X to the double exponential of X. And another way to say that the space X is totally separated is to say that this map is an embedding. If it's not, you can consider the image of this map, yeah? And this image will identify some points. In, in, for example, if you apply this to, this to the type with two infinities, uh, these two infinities are going to become the same, yeah, in the model. Uh, at the level of type theory, you don't know what's going to happen because uh, all toposes are models, so and different things are going to happen to this space. Uh, the other one uh, is to, to construct a totally separated reflection is you define an equivalence relation by saying the two points uh, are equivalent if they satisfy the same Boolean valued properties and you quotient by that. That gives you an, an, uh, another way to construct the reflection. Yeah? 
Uh, there is a third one, but I can tell you later. Yep, so the counter example, we, did, we mentioned it before, so forget models. So what can you prove inside the type theory? So you, this, this set of natural numbers fails to be compact. Uh, this fails doesn't mean not. It means that um, if it is compact, I mean, it is compact if and only if LPO, so the limited principle of omniscience holds, which says from any binary sequence, you can either find the position where it is one or say that all positions are zero, which is exactly what definition, yeah? So this is actually independent of Martin left type theory. It is false in realizability models because it's not computable. It is false in topological models because it is not continuous. And it's true in the model of classical sets by uh, actually excluded middle. I, I wrote choice, but that's wrong. Okay, so now, how am I going to do enough time? I finish a quarter, yeah. two, okay. Um, Okay, so we gave lots of counterexamples, yeah? So we better give an example. Well, we had the finite spaces, thanks to the question before. But one example is the, the type that we mentioned before, which is the one-point compactification of the natural numbers by looking at the type of all binary sequences which are decreasing, yeah? So you can embed, you have an injection from n to n infinity, and the intuition here, which is true in the topological topos, is that the sequence finitely many ones and then zeros, when you increase the number of finitely many ones, of course, uh, sort of converges to the sequence with infinitely many ones, and that's the idea. So, and uh, it's, you can prove in hot UF, UF that uh, the type n infinity is compact. But actually you can do it, um, you don't need hot uf, you can do this in system t, yeah? Um, and they published this in 2013. I'll give you a quick proof sketch, omitting the difficult part. Um, so suppose you have a predicate, a Boolean predicate, which we are not assuming to be continuous. So th this is something nice, because we're using the, the intuition of the topological topos, um, and we are going to prove that n infinity is compact in this sense, but uh, th the reason why this works in the topological topos is because p is continuous there. But here now we take an arbitrary one, maybe or may not continuous, I don't know. Um, and then what you do is the following. So you define a sequence beta, by saying that the nth element of beta is the minimum of p0, p1, p2, up to n. Yeah, and this is obviously decreasing because you're taking minimums. And um, now you check whether p of beta is zero or one. If p of beta is zero, we have found the root. We are done. Now, if p of beta is one, what you have to do is to, you have to prove that this implies that P of alpha equals one for every alpha, yeah? So, and then it means there is no root. Uh, this is easy to prove classically, of course, but it's a little bit subtler how to do this constructively, so I'm not going to do it now, but uh, if you know, if you're a logician and know of the so-called drinker paradox, it says in the pub n infinity, there is a person beta such that if beta drinks, then everybody drinks. Yep, that's what they say. So the drinker paradox is a tautology in classical logic, but is not uh, in constructive mathematics. But in this case, it holds. Okay, there's some consequences, but... Um, okay, so I'm proud that actually two people, two groups of people use the, com the compactness of n infinity. So um, in, the, in the elephant, Johnston's, Peter Johnston's book on topos theory, there is a fairly elaborate argument to show that if Cantor, Schroeder, 
uh, Bernstein theorem is uh, true, then some weak form of excluded middle holds. Yeah? Uh, but these people use the compactness of n infinity to show that actually Kant Cantor Bernstein Im implies excluded middle. Yeah, and so it is equivalent to excluded middle, and they use this. Uh, they also implemented this in Koch. And the other one is more interesting. So in 1958, uh, Tate proved uh, something about the definability of the fun functional in Clinis S1, S9. And uh, the result is true, but the proof had a gap. And this was uh, something that actually was never published, but was circulated uh, among all the computability theorists up to this day. I, in fact, I was given a proof uh, a photocopy of the manuscript by Tate, uh, like 10 years ago by Doug Norman. But actually, when they were writing it up, they found that actually there was a gap. And I'm proud that they filled it using the compactness of N-infinity. Okay, so now we want, to, we want to build more compact sets, yeah? So we have a 0, 1, N-infinity, and then if you do the sum of two compact sets, it's compact. You also have baby Tikhonov. So the answer is uh, Steve's question. Uh, so the product of two compact types is compact. That's easy to prove. Um, also, if you consider a sum of compact sets indexed by a compact index set, this is also compact. And um, and four is a, bit, a little bit more complicated, but it's important. So let's look at it slowly. So suppose you have a function that picks an element Ax of the type Ax for any given point of x. Yeah? Uh, suppose that also this index set x is a proposition. So it has at most um, one element. Yeah? Classically, it's empty or inhabited empty or singleton. Yeah, so then the product of these spaces is compact. I call this micro Tikhonov because it's indexed by a sub-singleton, yeah? So you have baby Tikhonov and micro Tikhonov. You may want to ask yourself whether we have a full Tikhonov. And we can ask a particular question of that. Is the Cantor state uh, type provably compact in our type theory. Unfortunately, it isn't. And therefore, you cannot prove Tikhonov because Tikhonov will give you that, yeah? And so how do we know that? So in fact, it's independent. So it is true in the topological topos because the notions of compactness can coincide at least for totally separated types, but it's false in Highland's effective topos. So, um, and the reason, if you have heard of clinitries, so you can use a clinitree to, uh, to give a counterexample to that. It is true in other realizability toposes. So there's a topos called the Clini Vesley topos, which uses realizability of Clini's second combinatory algebra. It's true there. And, uh, just a side remark, which is not very important for this talk. Um, so you can consider the simple types in the realizability topos over K2 or over the topological topos. This topos is a very different. One is built out of topology. The other one is built out of computation. But the, sim the category of simple types of these two toposes are equivalent. I consider this to be some kind of magic. But actually, there is an explanation. There is a paper by John Longley called On the Ubiquity of Certain Type Structures, which shows that um, in lots of categories, if you construct the simple types, you will end up with, um, uh, with the same thing. So the clinic, Riesel, continuous functionals. OK, so let's now. Uh, let's see how much time we have. Okay, have some time. So we have constructed the, this type, so we can, you can keep iterating these, and then we get uh, more and more compact types. Um, 
but they are all well ordered. So of course, the empty type is well ordered. The, the one point type is well ordered. And n infinity is also well ordered. You have to be careful how you define less than. But uh, let's keep this intuitive unless somebody asks. But uh, it's an exercise for the attendee to, to give an order. And then you can order the Cartesian product uh, lexicographically in the usual way. So you get actually the ordinal sum. And you can do the same for the sum. Well, almost. We have a problem. Okay? So we need to address two things here. We have a problem with sigma, and then we want to actually build more than just one, two, and three. Okay? Okay, so you define the lexicographical order, and let me skip this. You know what the lexicographical order is. Now, the problem is the following. The the extensionality condition. When you try to prove the extensionality condition for the lexicographical order, you don't succeed. And then you think hard, and then um, you derive excluded middle. Actually, it was done by Mike Schulman. I was discussing the, pro uh, the problem with Mike, and so Mike uh, gave an example where you, if the lexicographical order was um, extensional then excluded middle holds. However, it is extensional in many cases. One is when the giver orders have top elements. In, in particular, n infinity has a top element, which is infinity. They, oh, it also works when the given orders are trichotomous. Yeah? And the sum actually preserves this property of having top or the property of being trichotomous. Uh, it also works when the orders are co-transitive, but uh, I, I don't think this is preserved by taking sigma, yeah? Okay, so what I'm going to do is, uh, in the examples I'm going to consider, I'm going to either restrict myself to ordinals which have a top element, or restrict myself to ordinals which are trichotomous. And what I want to do now is I want to consider suprema of ordinals, which is, the, which is one of the results um, published today. Because it's published, I'm not going to explain it. it so, to save time, uh, I'm proud of the... We have two ways. Um, Tom came up with a way, and I came up with another way, and Tom implemented both in Agdam. You can also read the ACTA file if you don't want to read the paper. Um, but the point is the following. Maybe I should discuss it a little bit. Yeah, sorry, I have to discuss it. I cannot get away without discussing it. Yeah, suppose you have a family of um, ordinals alpha, as in the top, and you want to, uh, you want to, compute the supremum. So you define a function from the sum of the i's and so this angle bracket means the underlying type of the ordinal, so forget the order and the structure and so on. We define a map from this to the type of ordinals. Uh, so it sends i comma x to the lower set of alpha i. So you take an ordinal alpha, pick a point of uh, x of alpha, and look at all the things below x, uh, this is another ordinal, yeah? So you do this, and now you take the image of that, and, um, and this gives you the supremum. Um, now, if alpha were compact and i were compact, then the sum is compact. I told you this is true, yeah? Sums of compact ordinals indexed by compact sets Okay, now another thing that is true is that the image of a compact set is compact, just like in topology, but it holds formally here, which means that um, if you take a supremum of compact ordinals indexed by a compact set, then the supremum itself will be compact. 
Yeah, so that's this corollary here. Um, well, it's defined to be the least upper bound, but it's constructed like this. So you define this uh, map from sigma i alpha i to the type of all ordinals. Yeah. You have to prove that this is the least upper bound. Yeah. It's going to be unique. And univalence plays a role. Um, okay. Yeah, so a supremum of compactly many compact ordinals is compact. Yeah, it exists and is compact. Okay, the other thing, I'm going to skip the proof because we are running out of time. So the type of ordinals is injective. But uh, let's skip that. Because I want to show you something else. So you can consider notations or codes for ordinals. So we define this W type inductively. So you have a Z element, which is going to be zero in the standard interpretation successor, which is successor, and then limit. So we have countably many ordinals, and then you get an ordinal. So these are trees, these are not ordinals. Actually, these trees can be given a well order, by the way. Um, um, yeah, so now we can interpret this in four ways. Yeah, so we can define an, uh, a function from these Brouwer ordinals to the type of ordinals um, in four ways. So in one way, I interpret zero as the empty type, which is an ordinal successor as plus one and limit as supremum. Yeah, I call this the standard interpretation. Then there is what I call the trichotomous interpretation is the same as before, but I change sup to sigma. Yeah, so all the ordinals you get are trichotomous. And then I consider the compact interpretation, and um, which gives you compact ordinals. And, and it is for this that I needed to discuss the injectivity. So the Brouwer ordinals are indexed by n. But then what we want to do is we want to show that this map extends to an infinity. That's with the in injectivity. It extends to an infinity. And so I take the supremum, not of the original sequence, but the supremum of the sequence extended to an infinity, which I skipped, it was four slides. Uh, and then I get a compact ordinal. And this, uh, if you read the, all the slides that I skipped, uses in particular also the micro Tikhonov theorem. And the other one is the same, but I do some. Yeah? So in this interpretation number three is a good one because um, I get compact, uh, totally separated ordinals. Yeah? And I get plenty of them. And so now, using Brouwer ordinal codes, you can define very high ordinal notations using the techniques by many people in the community. And so you can define ordinals as big, or, VIP, or slightly bigger perhaps, because we change uh, sup to sigma, as big as you can define ordinal notations in type theory. So to each notation, there will correspond a compact ordinal, yeah? And uh, if you assume excluded middle, which I don't like to assume, then these interpretations are related like this. Yeah, so the biggest one is actually the compact, totally separated one. So the reason you need excluded middle is that plus one, annoyingly, is not a monotone function constructively. And I finish here. I have more slides, but I finish here. 
So uh, we have two interpretations, the, what I call the trichotomous interpretation and the, and, the and the compact totally separated interpretation. So every ordinal in, the, in, the, in this interpretation where the limit operation is taken to be sigma, all these are discrete. This means that they have decidable equality. Moreover, they are trichotomous and uh, they are countable. They also retract of the natural numbers, but they are compact if and only if LPO holds. So they are not between codes compact. And the other ones are all compact and you can prove, and it's a little bit complicated, you can prove that they are all retracts of the Cantor space and therefore totally separated because total separatedness is inherited by retracts, but is they are not countable unless the WLPO holds. So if you have LPO, these two, these two hierarchies on each side, they become equal actually. There is no difference between the two, uh, but there is, without uh, excluded middle or LPO, there is always an embedding of the trichotomous hierarchy into the compact hierarchy and it has a very funny property. It's an embedding and the complement of the image is empty. Yeah, so then it's a classical mathematician. So, so a bijection, right? <laughs> but it's not a bijection. Uh, this funny thing can happen in, in, uh, in uh, constructive mathematics. Uh, so if you look at the realizability toposes, the reason this is not a bijection is that um, it, it, you can say, well, classically it is a bijection, but there is no computable inverse. And in the, in the case of the topological topos, this discrete type, so the types that have decidable equality, they get the discrete topology, and this is why they are called discrete, so they coincide. So, um, so you, you have actually an embedding of a discrete space into a compact space. And even if you look classically in the meta theory, these types actually have the same set of points, yeah? but they have very different topologies. One is discrete and the other is compact Hausdorff. You can map to the discrete, from the discrete to the compact Hausdorff, but there's no way you could do the, the converse, yeah? And uh, we, I'll stop here, just say one more thing very quickly. You can do this for the Brouwer ordinals, but uh, even better, you can recursively, inductively define a universe of ordinals, which actually gives you more ways of constructing ordinals, but I don't have time. I think I finish one minute before my time, or two according to this clock. Sorry, thank you. <laughs>